I think we'll um, start with a few thoughts from each of our panellists and, um, and then move on to some questions. If I can uh, briefly introduce you know our speaker from this morning, I didn't need to introduce you. Um, uh, Nola Leach is Chief Executive of CARE in the UK and uh, CARE over the years has been engaged in uh, this subject uh, both individually as an organisation in uh, providing information for our supporters and encouraging, uh, encouraging them to take action, but also in discussions with parliamentarians and, uh, and others. Uh, secondly, CARE has been involved, I think, um, in terms of its interaction and leadership in bringing people together in coalitions uh, very effectively. And then um, our third panellist, Dr. Peter Saunders, heads Christian Medical Fellowship and um, has been involved in this issue. It's one of the key issues, I think, that you've been involved in since you've been in the UK. And um, so we have a, a fantastic panel. Uh, it's international. Um, Peter, you came originally from New Zealand, so it's truly international. I'm happy to take any questions on the cricket as well. So. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's for, for the first time, England didn't lose a series in the cricket. That's the, the teaching story. But thank you very much again to all of you. And um, could, I, could I ask you at the start, please, to, to introduce where you think we should be focusing on our discussion? OK. Um, I'll start with a, a, a remark. Um, you know, you've, you've just heard me uh, expressing my concerns in, in, in the previous session. Uh, I want to under underline something. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. You know, and on this topic, it's more evident than ever that you have to somehow achieve communicating your real concern for the well-being of people, your understanding of the depth of their suffering, uh, uh, et cetera. So uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a task for us sort of as the preamble when we're dealing with this, uh, to have our hearts on board. Yeah? This is not just a game. We're not talking about something uh, that's a gimmickry. We're talking about an authentic, genuine <coughs> concern for the well-being of our fellow human beings. You've got to communicate that. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, uh, in terms of yeah, practicalities, I, I, I think we have uh, two people here who have really sp you know, spent a lot of time um, doing the, the practical work of, of holding back uh, a, a lot of legislation uh, that might have come your way in the UK. And uh, so I, I think on, to, on the practical issues which we're going to be getting into, I'm going to you know, defer quite a lot to, to you guys, um, though I know that there were some questions left from, from my session, so feel free to ask them, but thank you. Thank you. Nola, do you want to... Yes, I think one of my observations is, is what Henk has already said, is that we are in a real battle for hearts and minds because people are making decisions just on the emotional arguments and not on the facts. But it's all very well to sit here and say that. What we have to do, I think, is use language and approach it if we're trying to influence legislators particularly. Echoing really what Henker said, that we're, we have a positive alternative. We've got a positive message that is so vital that if we're really caring for people, we don't go down the route of killing them. Um, there's, you know, there's the phrase about um, killing the pain, not the patient. And, and the, there's something really important in the language that we use to try and recapture the hearts and minds. And that means in the media, as well as in Parliament and those we're dealing with in terms of, of creating legislation. Because on a superficial level, people, certainly in the UK, and it may well be in your countries, if you ask them the simple question, are you in favour of physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia, they will say yes. Thank you, Nola. Um, Peter, I, I remember back to the mid-1990s when we had the House of Lords Medical Ethics Select Committee. And back then, the, uh, the experience in the Netherlands was pretty influential in in uh, persuading that House of Lords committee to vote against any change in the law. Um, do you think that um, 
the Netherlands continues to be uh, uh, an influential factor in the debate in the UK. I think the, the very fact that our opponents don't want to talk about the Netherlands or about Belgium, but only want to talk about the US states of Oregon and Washington in a very selected way, is, is evidence that what's coming out of uh, the Netherlands and Belgium is incredibly damaging to their case. And I think the case against the legalisation of euthanasia or assisted suicide from a purely consequentialist or evidence-based point of view is far, far stronger now than it was in the mid-90s because we've seen these jurisdictions running with these changes in the law for a longer period of time. Uh, however, despite that, what I find extraordinary is that as things get worse, the voices for the change in the law are just as strident and even more blind. And it's, uh, uh, remember Malcolm Muggeridge, who was a, uh, a British journalist who became a believer. And uh, he used to say that if you take a frog and put it into hot water, it will jump out. But if you take a frog and put it into cold water and gradually bring that water to the boil, the frog will make no attempt to escape until it's boiled to death. And, and uh, human beings are not unlike frogs in this regard, that if the cultural temperature changes gradually enough, most people don't see it. And I think what I'd, I'd want to do right at the beginning is to say, let's, uh, let's just take a step back and look at the bigger picture here first of all, because what we're really seeing, I believe, is, is a working out of the logical consequences of, first of all, the new atheism, and secondly, secular humanist ethics. And we've seen a progression starting with easy divorce, the legalization of abortion, same-sex marriage, erosion of civil liberties, um, embryo research and everything get, that goes with it. And the last great frontier is euthanasia. I think that's the last domino to fall in Western civilization. When it does, it, it'll be terrible. But uh, think of it from an atheist or secular humanist perspective. If human beings are just clever monkeys, if death is the end, if there are no absolute moral values, if suffering is something to be avoided at all cost, then actually euthanasia makes perfect sense. And, and I think we, we have, there are four features which are characterizing the, the, the worldview that most people, including many Christians, have, have uh, grab, uh, grabbed hold of now, uh, which I think explain the trajectory of this debate. And, and the four principles are these. Firstly, autonomy. It's my choice. You know, I want it. Secondly, um, compassion. Uh, avoidance of pain and suffering. I need it. The third plank is technology. We can do it. And then the final plank is moral relativism. Why not? We want it. We need it. We can do it. Why not? And uh, I, I think the reason that, that euthanasia is not taken off wholesale when 20 years ago it looked like it would, um, whereas we see, say, same-sex marriage going like wildfire throughout the world, uh, I think the reason is this, is that as Christians in the euthanasia debate, we have uh, two very powerful uh, sets of co-belligerent voices who may not agree with us on other things but are totally with us on this. And, and one of them is the medical profession, which is still largely conservative in most countries, yeah. except in those countries, interestingly, where the law has changed. And the other group uh, is the disability rights movement, um, who are often left of centre politically they're not with us on abortion, same-sex marriage, and so on. But they really get 
vulnerability. They really get coercion and they really understand uh, the dangers of people thinking there's such a thing as a, a life not worth living and making value judgments about the quality of their lives. Uh, so that's the kind of bigger cultural picture, if you like. Thank you, Peter. Both um, Peter and Nola have um, referenced public opinion in the UK. I wonder if you might talk a little bit more about the, the current state of public opinion in the Netherlands. I think um, one of the most dramatic reversals in contemporary policy and politics around the world has been the reversal of the position in Amsterdam with regard to legalized prostitution. And the decision by the mayor of Amsterdam to basically reverse a decision taken 10 years ago to, uh, to, to dramatically liberalize that area of life. It, it's astonishing to me that that in a European culture has happened so quickly. Do you see any um, evidence that public opinion might shift on this issue in the Netherlands? Well, um, I'm, I'm glad for the question. It's actually a very tough question. Uh, in the first place, uh, one has, uh, let's say, the, the earlier astonishing um, reversal that we went from being one of the most morally conservative nations in Europe in the first half of the 20th century to being one that squandered uh, its, um, uh, let's say, its safety networks uh, wholesale after the revolutions of the 60s. The interesting thing is that uh, when um, I, I had sometimes attend the meetings of the Dutch uh, pro-euthanasia movement, the NVVA, and uh, was surprised uh, the first time I went uh, that uh, I turned out to be the youngest person in the room. I'd hoped to be incognito uh, when, I, when I went there and that they all pounced on me because they were so happy to see new blood. And so, uh, you know, I, <laughs> it was a rather uncomfortable visit. But anyway, um, uh, what turned out was that these were all people who had their sort of their, their starting point in the libertarian movements of the 60s, the hippie era. Uh, this was the baby boomer generation that had autonomy at the top of their agenda. And um, uh, in this sense, I think there is an opportunity in the Netherlands with the new generation to re-argue this case because they are not the activists. The young generation is not the pro-euthanasia pro uh, activist. Uh, it is an older generation that is busy killing themselves off rather quickly that, um, that, is, uh, that is, is fostering uh, this ideal. So I see an opportunity there. It's one more reason for me to talk as much as possible. Um, uh, looking one step further, there have been a few issues where we, we see the first signs of backlash. One of them is the incremental increase of psychiatric categories for which uh, euthanasia is taking place. A lot of people are starting to ask, is it a good idea to, to you know, kill somebody at their most vulnerable moment? You know, you have an episode of depression and somebody says, well, let's help you out of life. Um, uh, the, you know, that's, uh, the, the, there have been three reprimands over the last year of the free will end of life clinic. When I say reprimands, that doesn't mean that any legal procedure has been exercised against them, but it's been public nonetheless. For the first time, we're getting, uh, we have these mobile euthanasia units, 30 of them, 31 to be exact, that, uh, that go around the country. When your own physician doesn't want to kill you, they'll come and you know, help expedite the process. Um, but they've been reprimanded for not doing due procedure well enough on psychiatric patients. The, the, the second issue is the advanced directors of people with dementia. People with dementia uh, may have an advanced directive that says, I want to die when I reach advanced stages of dementia. The only thing is that once they get there, uh, they are more likely than not when a physician asks them, okay, it's, uh, you know, it's time to, to kill you, uh, can I kill you? They say, I don't want to die, do you want to die? You know, that's, uh, um, that's, that's the natural human, uh, human condition, is, is, is to understand that life is, is something uh, worth having. You know, it's taken us a lot of very complicated arguments to convince each other that it's worth killing. Um, and so, so th there are people uh, who, who want the advanced directive to be uh, ironclad law which would want to force, our, our former Minister of Health, Els, Els Bors, actually argued this in, in Parliament, that, that advanced directives should be exercised even when patients say they don't want to die. Now, a lot of Dutch physicians rebelled against that, thankfully, but it's the first time that you start to get a push and pull in the public arena on whether we should be doing as much as you know, autonomy 
would seem to, to argue for. Naila, you um, yeah. have uh, led an um, Emerging Leaders initiative, the mm. Care Intern Program, mm. uh, which has run for the last 30 years, and also involved in, in communicating with the emerging generations. Do you, do you see a similar uh, change in the UK? It's interesting, just before I answer that one, can I make one other observation? I, I, I mentioned public opinion, and we, we were talking about public opinion, and I made the statement that in the UK, the majority of people would say, yes, they want euthanasia. Unless you dig beneath the surface, and we did some polling um, during the course of, of, of one of a bill that was going through, through the House of Lords, that showed that when you asked subsequent questions, the figures shifted dramatically. And when people really looked at how it affected them, the nearer it got to them, the statistics showed that it was about equal, and it was about 42% of those who were polled who said, actually, no, I wouldn't want it. So I think we have a real educative job to do in terms of, of, of seizing the conversation and, and, and talking about it, which, which can be very valuable. In terms of younger people, I think, there's a, I think there's a mixture of things happening. Certainly, I think if we think of the young leaders that we've been working with, I would say that overwhelmingly, they are very concerned about the issue. And I think actually probably more concerned about the value of life at, at the end of life than they are perhaps at the beginning of life, actually, although I think that's changing. And I think we do have an opportunity there. Um, and I think it's our responsibility as those who are older to, to, to use that and to, um, to equip them to be the leaders, to be talking about that. Because many of us who are campaigning on it are the older generation. I don't class myself in that, of course, but we are. Um, and actually, we need the young leaders who are speaking out. And I think there, are, I think there is a shift. I don't know what you think, Peter, because you deal with, with, with younger doctors, of course, as well, don't you? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we're seeing it as dramatically um, in the UK, but I, ha I don't... I'm not sure I've got at my fingertips the the percentages of different age groups that that would really be well well worth looking at i think in in the uk and i'm not sure if this is true of other european countries but uh, the younger generation tend to be more politically left yes uh, so we're seeing a lot of young people voting for the green party or so on and because being pro-euthanasia is seen as a politically left thing by those who don't know much about it. I think if you ask people for their uh, pronto response or their gut reaction to the issue, you, you'll get the same sort of answer that, that we've found in most polling, you know, 70 to 80 percent in favour of it. What was fascinating about your research is that people were specifically asked, would you change your view um, knowing that? And we gave them five yeah. statements. And uh, those statements were, if you change the law, people feel under pressure to end their lives so as not to be a burden on others. Uh, number two, in jurisdictions where the law has changed, like the Netherlands, we've seen incremental extension. In other words, you start with the terminally ill, send the chronically ill. You start with the mentally competent, send the competent. You start with adults, and then children. Third one was most disability or all disability rights groups are against this. Uh, the medical profession's against it. You know, so once people knew these things, they changed their minds, and and so it was pretty clear that they were making up their minds on the basis of emotive cases that were presented on the media. Um, and it was largely a reflex process. And, and so, yes, it's true that public opinion is in favor, but it is, first of all, it's not, commit, it's not um, informed public opinion. Uh, the evidence of that is when you tell, give people the arguments now, I can generally change the views of a lot of people just by talking about the consequences. Uh, secondly, it's not committed public opinion. 
Now, what I mean by that is that it's not influencing the vote at the ballot box. I don't think this is a big issue uh, for people. Um, and it's, it's uh, also not convincing public opinion because there are lots of things that the public is in favour of that we don't change the law on. Most people would like lower taxation, for example. But if you're taking the bigger picture, you recognise that we need a certain level of taxation in order to provide goods and services. So, and this is precisely why uh, it's parliamentarians who make these rules, not the, you know, not the, the rabble. So uh, the, the public, the, the majority argument is, I don't think, not a convincing one at all. And we should knock it on the head. Thank you, Pijan. We'll open up to uh, questions and comments. Um, just a quick um, thought that we have uh, fantastic expertise here. Um, we should perhaps bear in mind that this is the Politics and Society Network. So um, try to, uh, let's try to keep our discussions in relation to that aspect of this subject. There are huge questions and concerns in relation to the specifically medical or technical side, which I know Peter would be thrilled to answer after our discussions. Um, but uh, let, let's try and keep it on policy and, and contemporary. Um. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, uh, you, you ask ac actually a very, um, let's say, uh, a complex question with many, many layers. Uh, I'll say a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, the data uh, that the Dutch government has collected uh, is uh, universally accepted, at least in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, you know, it is, it is well researched. Uh, it was done with anonymized uh, questionnaire type uh, research often. Um, and, and it's very useful data. Uh, it's, it's out there, it's every five years, and um, it's a pretty compelling uh, you know, load of data, that's the data set that's, that's available uh, now. Now, people like to pick and choose the parts that suit their argument, uh, and so uh, one does need to do the hard work of diving in uh, to, uh, to the data and, and uh, letting it speak fully. Um, but, but on that score, I think there's a lot. What I would like to see, which is not yet there, and I'm actually trying to get some Dutch groups to, to invest some research money in this, and that is to, um, to indicate uh, how true it is that physicians can accurately diagnose the moment of death. Now, of course, when you're giving people chemicals that are going to you know, enforce their death at a certain moment, it becomes quite easy to diagnose when, they're, when they will die. But if you're not doing that, uh, our, our, you know, um, a lot of our, our uh, attitudes are premised on the idea that uh, somebody is roughly terminal, you know, that, that, that they know when, when that person is going to die. And um, there's not really good research indicating how well uh, physicians uh, uh, do, do in terms of estimating uh, when somebody is, the, the one person dies within a day and the other one <coughs> dies three months later, or, or three years for that matter. We all hear stories of, of physicians getting it wrong. Um, and so we shouldn't premise our policies on the ability of a physician uh, to, to estimate when, when somebody's going to be dead, you know, with, a, with a, a, a treatment that's going to sort of enforce that death. So I, I would like to see some, some research there. That's missing data, if you, if you ask me. Um, yeah, I, I will leave. Do you, do you have... uh, well, I'd just add, I mean, Peter is, is, is obviously, as a, as a medical person, far more capable to answer that than I. But just as an observation, I would certainly say that I've sat with, with members of the House of Lords who have a medical background, who all of them say that, make that point. You cannot, it's not a, an exact science. You cannot determine exactly when someone is going to die. And I would imagine that, I, mean, I don't know if you're aware of actual research that, that, that points to that, but certainly that is what, what they are saying. I, I, I want to say one more thing. A word like terminal, watch out for this one. Yeah. Because to talk about something being legitimized because somebody has a terminal condition, you know, we all have a terminal condition. We're all going to die someday, and and yes, you know, and, and yeah. uh, you know, for the one, it's because he or she has diabetes, and for the other, it's because uh, their cardiovascular system is not working quite the way it should. But uh, you know, in a broken world, we're all terminal, and so so it's such a slippery slippery Can I make term. One observation as well, actually, just in, which is a very practical one. Um, 
I mean, yes, it is vitally important, and, and certainly speaking from a UK context, um, we have care has produced lots of, of, of research and briefings for MP and with care not killing as well. Huge, really, really good evidence-based stuff. One of the tragedies is that when you listen to the debates in the House of, Parli House of Parliament and the House of Lords, as it was recently, the debate usually centres around emotional stories. And I think where there is a real gap is providing people with the ammunition, with the stories from the other side, because we all know there are the bad cases, sadly, but we need the other stories. Uh, and no, no, um, CARE is a, a member organisation in the sense that there are lots of uh, volunteers and supporters. Mm. Uh, have you found that people are willing from the CARE community to provide those stories? Yes. Um, but I think it needs much more of a concerted effort to, to collect those stories and to, and to have the good stories, yeah. Peter, would you comment on that briefly and then come on to protecting the, the medical community in terms of the, the need for uh, improved data and evidence, both statistics but also stories from individuals? Yes, I think data and stories which back up our side of the argument are incredibly useful. They're harder to get into the public domain because simply because we're not the ones trying to change the law and the media tend to be dominated by people with more of a secular worldview uh, who are promoting that kind of view. We, 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 call, we say that we're up against uh, not just Dignity in Dying, our former voluntary euthanasia society, but uh, their most formidable weapon is their press office, otherwise known as the BBC. <laughs> and this, this is the problem that we have. With, with regards to survival, uh, there's lots of research on survival rates uh, with various conditions, huge amount. But it's all of the order of people with this specific cancer who are at stage X have an 80% five-year survival, okay? And those figures are undisputed, but they're about a population. Yeah. They don't tell you anything about what's going to happen to, to the individual. individual. And, and yet, uh, when people try and frame this for a law, it's mm. usually in terms of survival times. Yes. And I can tell you as a, you know, as not practicing now, but I was a general surgeon for many years, and you can predict pretty accurately that someone's going to die in the next 48 hours. Not always. Yeah. When it's weeks and months, years, absolutely hopeless. You know, no idea at all, because you're dealing with a huge spread. Yeah. And the, the problem with this is that you can't frame a law which will, A, uh, accurately identify the people within it, but B, that won't then be open to incremental extension uh, and further pushing. And, and the reason is this. Look at the arguments that are put forward for euthanasia. There are, there are mainly two. One is autonomy, I want it. The other is compassion, they, they need it. And then think about uh, the laws that are framed. Now, at the, we've just had a bill in the UK where it's been for terminally ill people with six months or less to live, who are mentally competent, in other words, they don't have a mental illness or dementia, and um, who are adults, so they're 18 years or older. Now, the minute you pass a law with parameters like that, uh, then someone will come up using exactly the same arguments of autonomy or compassion or both and a patient who falls just outside the parameters. So here is a person who's an adult with a terminal illness but not mentally competent but they would have wanted it. Uh, here's a child uh, who's not an adult but surely it's the compassionate and thing. This is exactly what has happened here is a person with chronic illness or a disability who's got more than six months left to live, even if you accept, you know, which you can't, when no doc could, can, can uh, predict it anyway, but they've got more than six months to live, but they are suffering unbearably. Isn't it uh, unfair, you see? And so 
therefore, people will use equality arguments and immediately, and I always use the term incremental extension, not slippery slope, because it's not a passive process. It's an active process whereby very clever activists are deliberately pushing the envelope, uh, bringing hard cases which are calling people's heartstrings. And, and the minute you pass a law allowing euthanasia or assisted suicide, in any circumstances at all, you're inviting, having surrendered the principle, new hard cases which will, will stretch them. That's inevitably yeah. what we see. Now, you only need, no one's mentioned uh, Germany yet a little earlier last century, uh, which is because there are very important lessons from that. But you only need four things for things to get really out of control. Number one, public opinion in favour. Well, we have that. Number two, a handful of willing doctors. You, you don't need a majority. Number three, economic pressure. Particularly where families, health services are under strain so that euthanasia assisted suicide becomes a treatment option and a very cheap treatment option as well. The final ingredient, and this is where it comes back to doctors, no prosecution for those involved. You don't have to change the law, just a, you know, a set of tick box guidelines where they can be pretty sure they won't be prosecuted. <coughs> With those four you've got the, the holocaust will eventuate in time. So but the, 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 there's nothing, it, it, this comes back to the question on doctors, so I'll, I'll finish very shortly, but the, the question about doctors is there's one thing a doctor fears more than anything, and this is what stops things getting worse. Doctors are absolutely terrified about losing their medical registration. And there's nothing that guarantees a doctor will lose their medical registration more than a criminal conviction, you see which is why uh, it's so important that to stop those who would go in this direction, there has to be a healthy fear of, if I cross this boundary, um, you know, the full weight of the law will fall upon me. And that's, uh, that may sound very cynical, but that's the only way really to control doctors. Thank you. As a doctor. basically the, the whole issue of definition and uh, I think this is connected also to um, confusion over, certainly in the 1990s, confusion over the double effect, so-called double effect. Uh, Peter, you spent a long time debating this. Can we have a for a comment? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question and we have to get our definitions right. And what the opposition do is that they they muddy the water of definition and say, oh, we're doing it anyway, so what's wrong with this? So uh, what's euthanasia? Euthanasia is the intentional killing of a person whose life is felt not to be worth living. That's what euthanasia is. Uh, assisted suicide is where the doctor or some other person helps the person to kill themselves. Now, euthanasia can be voluntary, where the person asks for it. It can be involuntary, where they don't ask for it, but you do it anyway. Or non-voluntary, where they're incapable of asking because they don't have mental capacity. Okay. But as well as defining what assisted suicide and euthanasia are, we need to be very, very clear what they aren't. The withdrawal or withholding of treatment when death is imminent and inevitable is not euthanasia. It's good medical practice. Uh, the, the, the fundamental difference is that is you ask, what's killing the person? Uh, in the first case, it's the doctor or the person themselves. In the second, it's actually the disease or the, the condition. 
So that's the first. Secondly, proportionate pain or symptom relief where the aim is to kill the pain and not the patient yes. is not euthanasia. It's what we call double effect. So if, for example, someone's in serious pain, severe pain, they're right at the end of life, you give them a strong drug like morphine, your intentions to remove the pain, if that has a secondary effect of shortening life, that's not euthanasia. So there's a difference ethically morally, philosophically, uh, biblically, I think, between intention and foresight. So you can in intend to kill, or you may do something else, but with foresight that it might shorten life. Now, having said that, it's largely a dead argument, because any, any good specialist in palliative medicine will tell you they can always kill the pain without killing the patient uh, in good hands, because the therapeutic dose is always below the toxic dose. And, and the third category um, is that if a competent patient refuses treatment and they die from their disease, that's not euthanasia. So now the, the other side will say, oh, we're doing it anyway. We're killing people with morphine. We're withdrawing treatment. But no, those are not euthanasia. And I think for, for me, um, I remember back to the 90s that it was always helpful to, um, to learn from medical friends that it is pretty difficult to kill someone medically by mistake. You, you, it is clear both at the time and also in terms of the records that are kept that um, there is an intent present. Next question. Yes, I think it's reframing what compassion is. I think we need to be talking about how we care for people at the end of life that enables them to, to, um, to have a good end. And it's not a good end to have um, physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia. I think there are arguments around the, the value of someone's life and the influence that they have on other people and the effects on others, um, not just the person themselves. So just thinking of the, the value of life, you know, where you've got stories of um, perhaps people with disabilities who have obvious, I mean, I'm thinking of a particular case of, for example, of somebody who rang us, really, really worried, a parent with a child who had multiple handicaps who within her family had a very positive um, quality of life with her siblings. But the parents' real fear that when they died, because their daughter was very willing to please others, you know, there would be a judgment made that her life was of no real no value and it would be better for her to end her life. She would probably agree. And I think there's a fundamental argument about pointing people to those people who might be said, well, they haven't really got a good quality of life, have they? And showing that actually that isn't the case. And I think that's, that's something that, that, that can be very powerful. And I think just delving down underneath what is actually being said, what are we really talking about? Are we actually giving people autonomy by saying they can end their lives? And I would say that actually we're not. We're probably not giving them autonomy, actually. And I, I think there are, there are those sorts of arguments. I think we need to recognise, though, that for many people, for Christians, they know, they might know with their head that biblically they should argue that it's wrong, but they've seen the bad cases. And it probably will be bad cases in their own family. And I think we have to be very sensitive to that. But I think we have to show that, that bad cases don't actually make good law. And actually the duty of the law of the land is to protect and to try and show in a very sensitive way that actually we're talking about something which will have very damaging consequences, perhaps to them as well. 
um, if the law is changed. But it, it, it's, I think it has to be done incredibly sensitively. Hank, do you have wisdom from Labrie as to well, culture uh, change? <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd like to say just a, a few things. Indeed, I, this, I think the starting point is when you're dialoguing with people is, is the observation. Hard cases make bad law. That means look at the, the large uh, uh, group, the, the masses that need to be protected. Uh, we're trying to push back dangers. That's, uh, the, the, this is uh, what legislation does. And number one, legal safeguards cannot protect the vulnerable from euthanasia. Uh, uh, and this is this is what is proven. So that's that's a, a, a point one. Uh, the legal safeguards don't work. That's a proven case. We're looking. Uh, secondly, by invoking the category, that means making it possible as an option. You create the sense of burden. That means I'm a vulnerable person with a handicap. As long as it's not legal to to opt out, the thing that good people do is care for me, because human beings care for one another. But if I could opt out and don't do it, I then am burdening my, lived, my loved ones. So by creating the category, I produce a whole sense of burden for a massive population. This is unfair. That's a, it's a very strong emotive argument. Um, ultimately, euthanasia and assisted suicide becomes tools for elder abuse. And the terms elder abuse are out there in the, in the public marketplace. We have to use them because it's true. Uh, this implicit pressure, you know, I don't want to be a burden to my loved ones. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, autonomy, my foot, uh, it is the way to rob people for, uh, of their autonomy. Um, it sends a hypocritical message about suicide, i.e. suicide contagion, uh, is, a, is a strong argument not to do it. Uh, because it's, uh, there's, there's enough research that points out that allowing for suicide at the end of life encourages suicide at other areas, uh, in other areas of life. Um, I could go on, but, but this kind of arguments, uh, I think we can, if, you, if you're interested, I could, I could give you, a, you know, eight primary arguments, but we'll do that in a while. Thank you. I, I think the key thing to grasp is that the arguments to use in the public square are different from those we'd use in the church, just because of the nature of the public square. So. If you're talking to a Christian who accepts biblical authority, then you would say human beings are made in the image of God, they're greatly precious, that uh, our lives don't belong to us, they belong to God, every life on the planet. It is written, you shall not kill. <laughs> and the way of Jesus was not assisted dying, but assisted living, <laughs> that he bore people's burdens and that's what we should be doing in fact you know we should be walking the path of the cross which means being a voice for the voiceless whatever it costs us and being the alternative uh, compassionate care solution rather than abandoning people so I mean that's the, the kind of Christian arguments and perhaps the icing on the cake is this that there's no greater disservice that you can do to any human being than to give them a lethal injection and propel them forward to a judgment for which they're not prepared. Okay, so putting it in a wider context. But when we're talking about the public square, we've found there's been three arguments which are really effective uh, in, the, in the public square and have stopped um, all around the world. They work in terms of change, uh, stopping parliaments changing the law. The first one is um, public safety. This is what you've said. If you change the law, you put pressure on vulnerable people to end their lives so as not to be a burden to others, and you can't control it. And, and the sound bite is, the right to die can so easily become a duty to die. In other words, autonomy, you use the autonomy argument against them. Legalizing euthanasia actually undermines autonomy because it puts people in a position where they can be coerced. Number two argument is palliative care. The sound bite, you can kill the pain without killing the patient. In other words, if you look after people properly, addressing not just their physical needs, but their psychological, spiritual and social needs as well, uh, virtually no one wants it. So we should provide good care. And then the third argument, because they'll always come back and saying, but what about this 
particular, you know, really hard case and so on, is this hard cases make bad law thing. And it's that the soundbite would be, if the law ain't broke, then why fix it? As we'd say in surgery, if it ain't broke, don't try and fix it. You'll cause bigger problems. And the best law, by far, is one which has a blanket ban on all killing. All euthanasia, all assisted suicide is illegal, but which at the same time gives discretion to prosecutors and to judges in hard cases so that they can, in biblical terms, temper justice with mercy. And, and the reason that kind of law is, mo is effective is because on the one hand it provides a very powerful disincentive against abuse and exploitation because people are afraid of what might happen to them if they break the law. But secondly, it gives discretion for people to show compassion in hard cases. So, so public safety, palliative care, and um, the best law is the one with the blanket ban. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. The, um, the, the first part of the, part of the question uh, how practically can Christians respond to uh, individuals and families seeking advice in this whole area of um, the interaction between a patient, the family, and the medical professions? And then secondly, the uh, positive case studies of how churches are responding. For me, I guess, in the UK, uh, the hospice movement coming out of the church is the thing that immediately springs to mind. But um, who would like to respond to both of those two questions, or at least the first one? How we help as uh, as people who are seeking to give guidance and, and support? Well, I'll say, say one thing uh, to that, uh, and that is that uh, everything indicates that the existential factors uh, are more important than the physical factors. Uh, though, though this debate is always talking about things like physical pain, the truth is that the existential factors, anxiety, fear, loneliness, this kind of more psychological existential realities, spiritual you might say, that they are hugely important. So the, the role, if one is asked, is a large one and an important one. Um, and, uh, and I think we should jump to to engage people at this level, uh, to, to play our role, to stand beside people. We are called to mourn with those who mourn. Huh? This is a, a command from Romans 12. Uh, to stand beside people in their suffering uh, means to listen. You don't necessarily need to have a solution uh, other than a, a willingness to share in, uh, in the existential uh, difficulty. Um, and. Uh, and to, to comfort people uh, in, uh, in their reality. Loneliness needs to be met by visiting. Huh? That's, a, that's a clear calling for the church. Many churches think they don't have a diaconal task anymore. And I think, you know, from which planet do you come? There are more lonely people in Western Europe than you could possibly imagine. Never has the, the, the need been as great as it is now. So, so there's a challenge for the church. And I would say creative projects, uh, there are lots of them out there, but if one wants to start one in your own setting, uh, start with uh, freeing people's time to visit those who are lonely. Mm. Yeah, I, I told, well, I just, I just emphasise that actually, to be there for people um, in their pain, walking the journey with them, and getting, you know, that there is help around. In, if you want to know sort of practical um, things to do, who to point people to, who to talk to. You know that there are those resources there, but I think it's it's as the church we have a unique role in being there for people and walking that journey with them and crying with them. Peter, the um, uh, the role of assisting when you're not a family member and not part of the the medical profession is that increasingly difficult in a litigious society. I think there's a massive challenge to the church here, not just that we think about these issues biblically, because there's a huge amount of confusion in the churches and 
many people have been swayed by the compassion and autonomy arguments. But the real challenge to the heart of the church is to provide the compassionate alternative to euthanasia. And uh, I couldn't agree more with Hank, Hank and Nola. Uh, this is not about pain. This is about existential or spiritual angst. I worked in East Africa as a missionary doctor where the medical care is uh, Spartan compared with what we get here. No one wants euthanasia. Why is it that in Europe, where medical care is better than it's ever been in world history, that we have such a demand for it? It's not a medical reason, it's a spiritual reason. And when you look at the uh, figures, the stats that are coming out of jurisdictions that have legalized it, take Oregon and Washington for example, the reasons people give for assisted suicide are 80 to 90 percent loss of autonomy, loss of enjoyment of life, loss of being able to do things that make life enjoyable, uh, loss of dignity. 60% fear of being a burden in Washington. Those are spiritual symptoms. Now we shouldn't be providing medical solutions for spiritual problems. And those are actually things that the church can meet because it's not just, um, not just loneliness and friendliness and so on. It's actually right at the heart of this. There's a loss of meaning, loss of hope, loss of purpose. A, a, a spiritual angst that is a symptom of a Europe and a Western civilization which has turned its backs on God. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for us to be people of the gospel who don't just bring the message of hope but actually bring Christ's love and compassion so that people don't want this anymore. Peter, thank you very much and also to Nola and Hank. I think that is a fantastic place to finish our, uh, our time together this week. Um, we are engaged in politics and society, all of us, and uh, we spend a lot of our time debating and uh, getting quizzed on very minuscule policy areas and uh, debating the finer points. But ultimately, it is about being part of a Christian community that is uh, absolutely essential for any of us who are seeking to be involved in this area of ministry, that we mustn't allow ourselves to be cut off from uh, the people of God. And um, the, the practical response which, which Peter's just ended there with, I think, is, is a, a fantastic take-home message that um, we may be fascinated by some esoteric area of, of policy and committing our all to that, <coughs> but, but ultimately we, we must do so in community as uh, part of the people of God. So thank you very much to our panel and um, for contributing. Thank you for your questions. And uh, we'll now formally come to a close for this session and move on to um, the next part. So thank you very much to those who've been recording. Thank you.